Hello and welcome to the Hitler Survival Guide 2016 of April webinar. And today we will discuss dwell time and the ABCs of launching a HIPAA initiative. Though the real focus here will be on uh, dwell time, that's the star of the show. I am John Nelson, I'm the resident technology evangelist here at Three Lions Publishing, the publisher of the HIPAA Survival Guide. And I'm also a attorney. I'm an associate at the Digital Business Law Group. We focus on internet law, intellectual property, and business consulting. Today I'm joined by our venerable Director of Retail Operations, Martin Goyne. Good afternoon. And uh, today we will, uh, well, before we go through the agenda here, uh, we like to uh, have a have a bit more involvement uh, with our attendees, so uh, feel free to use the chat feature of GoToMeeting to uh, type in a question as we go, or uh, from time to time we'll be stopping so we can collect some questions and uh, and address them uh, to uh, to everyone's satisfaction, hopefully. And uh, at the end, we'll also have a Q and A at the end to wrap up any remaining questions that we've got. So today uh, we'll be discussing dwell time, what it is, uh, why it's important, um, how to measure it, and how to reduce your dwell time. And uh, really it's, it's, a, uh, it's a great metric, uh, it's an emerging metric in cybersecurity, in the cybersecurity community uh, that's uh, it's it's sort of gain, gaining steam, but uh, but it's still emerging. Um, many cybersecurity professionals still focus on some other metrics uh, that we'll go into and uh, and why this one might be uh, preferable. Then we'll go into uh, a comprehensive initiative, what that is, and the difference between a comprehensive approach to HIPAA compliance and partial solutions that are uh, that are all over the marketplace and can be very helpful and uh, helpful towards uh, building your comprehensive initiative and also we'll be going over where uh, where they don't address. And finally we'll be going over the components of coverage which in our estimation includes the educational aspect of HIPAA and high tech knowledge, going over the requirements, uh, the requirements are really where it's at. Uh, because there's a lot of myth making around uh, HIPAA and high tech, what's required, what's not required, and and it's one of our goals to uh, dissuade that myth making. And we'll go through our step by step guidance and our methodology for really tackling this problem. And it's an agile methodology that we preach here at uh, Three Lines Publishing and the HIPAA Survival Guide. And all of these components, uh, from time to time, we will pull in. Uh, to connect to uh, dwell time and its ramifications uh, in, in complementary aspects of the several areas. So correspondingly, our learning objectives are to figure out uh, what dwell time is and, uh, and how we can use that where you plan to give a foundational knowledge and understanding here of uh, where we're going with that, as well as the comprehensive initiative the key components of coverage, and so on. So, getting right along with our dwell time metric. Dwell time has actually several meanings when you talk about uh, different uh, different contexts. Uh, in the cybersecurity context, dwell time uh, essentially means the amount of time that someone has access to your network, unauthorized access, without them yet being detected. So it's just that limbo time of someone's someone's in your network and you don't even know it. Yet. Or if you do know it, then you haven't been successful in kicking them back out of your network yet. And uh, it would also include uh, where a malicious actor uh, just leaves. Say they've gotten what they came for, uh, they try to cover their tracks as best they can, and they move on to the next target. Now, it's important to know that uh, when it comes to the compromise of your network and, uh, and during your uh, very vulnerable dwell time period, you may not have attacks necessarily on your network. They could be just using your network as a launching pad to launch attacks 
elsewhere because your network, uh, you know, your your legitimate organizations uh, with track records of reliability, so your networks are trusted. They're not on any blacklists or gray lists, and anyone receiving connections from them will you know will be more prone to accept. The bad guys know that, and that's why they try to compromise trusted networks in order to have uh, in order to open doors into other places that they want to go. So the average dwell time is surprisingly high. Um, I, I know I was surprised when I first learned about this. Uh, the average dwell time, someone is in a network uh, and is undetected or hasn't been kicked out, is over 146 days. Now that's just uh, that's just this year, actually. It's, it has been steadily going down. Last year, it was 205 days. And the year before that, I believe it was 226 or 27. Very, a very long time, enough, enough for them to call the cable guy and, and have subsequent fights over bills. So why does dwell time matter? Well, obviously, if they're in there for so long, uh, they have more opportunities to scan your network to uh, find the kill zone, the kill zone being what they either came here for or what they've found that will be valuable to them either from a, uh, a financial perspective, let's say they, uh, they get your EPHI records, uh, which are worth roughly $300 on the black market as opposed to a credit card, which is a uh, credit card number is only worth about 12 to $15 on the market, so obviously EPHI is incredibly valuable. Or it could be uh, uh, many other issues. Uh, malicious actors are motivated by several uh, uh, several aspects. Some obviously financial, others uh, just want to test their technological know-how and see what they can see what they can find. Uh, curiosity factor. Then there is also a reputation. Uh, many uh, many hackers, many uh, malicious individuals will uh, will attack networks just to uh, make a political statement or to embarrass the organization in some way. And um, it's very important to to take care of this matter because uh, just in 2015, as you can see, there were over 1,600 publicly reported security breaches, and those are just the publicly reported ones. Obviously, not including any uh, any of the thousands or tens of thousands of breaches. Uh, actually, I believe there was about 80,000 uh, for 2014 that happened, and and these caused almost 2 million files to be stolen uh, or lost um, through data destruction or something like that every single day. So roughly 700 million files uh, are gone per year. So, uh, so reducing dwell time actually uh, attacks this issue by reducing your surface area and understanding that the perimeter, which is where cybersecurity has been focused on heretofore, uh, is is already breached. Uh, the moat and castle walls approach to cybersecurity, uh, while it's still useful, um, is is not the paradigm uh, that controls or should control at this point. There are simply too many different attacks. There are too many different points of entry into your network, into the network of any organization, big or small, to simply focus on let's keep the bad guys out. At this point, you have to assume that they are already in. And um, we are also going to talk about why other metrics uh, outside of dwell time that are currently more prominent or have been more prominent in the past uh, may not be as reliable as, as they used to see. Now, one of the reasons why you have to assume that your, uh, your perimeter defenses are not sufficient, they may keep out you know, a certain percentage of, of bad guys, but they're not going to take out all of them, uh, mainly because uh, the strategies for, a, for compromising a network and gaining unauthorized access are developing all the time. And whereas even a few years ago, there might have, uh, most attacks would have come from simply one, one vector. That's, uh, they might be attacking one port or one vulnerable piece of code, one, uh, one attempt at uh, SQL injection or cross-site scripting, very common 
attack methods. Now uh, it's becoming more prominent to have uh, to have attacks that are developed over time. So they will come in pieces. Each piece on its own won't raise any particular red flags, or if it does, uh, it will likely be seen as a false positive. And uh, once these pieces are put into place over time, then the final one comes in, the puzzle is completed, and they're able to take command and control of your network or, um, or accomplish whatever their goals may be. So the answer here is not to, uh, is not to abandon uh, your, your current security methods, not to turn off your firewall, obviously, or, or to keep security patches uh, up to date. They think, well, if they're already in, then what's the point? They do still have a point. All of these features do actually make it, uh, make the investment for, uh, for hackers and other malicious actors to, uh, to be higher. So uh, they simply might be uh, deterred from going into your network because another target is easier. You, know, you, don't, you don't have to be faster than the bear, you just have to be faster than your slowest friend. So uh, this, this may protect your organization just by making uh, the attempt to get in more difficult. But once again, you do have to assume that they're already in. So the, uh, the method that we, uh, that we suggest is keeping those perimeter measures intact and going, for, uh, going after uh, the assumption that people are already in your network. So uh, some other metrics. Um, that uh, that are commonly used are one infected hosts. So if you have uh, a number of endpoints uh, that you have detected have some have been compromised in some way, some network equipment that's been compromised, you can count all those and say, well, you know, we've only got uh, we've only had 15 breaches in in X amount of time, uh, as opposed to last year we had uh, we had 20 more breaches. Well, that may be well and good, you, you're, you're detecting less, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there are less. So you, it, doesn't, it simply doesn't account for uncaught instances of infection or other compromises to your network, its endpoints, or, or so on. And another, uh, another popular metric is the number of security incidents that you have. Uh, if you utilize a SIEM, a security information event manager, uh, those throw up all of these security instances, uh, which you may have thousands per day. And obviously many of them are false negatives. They may be uh, sorry, false positives. They may be true negatives. So it's, it's very easy for, for that number, whatever number is reported, to be artificially high or artificially low. So again, it's just like with the known infection metric, it's difficult to know uh, whether that's whether it's a good thing that you don't have very many uh, incidents or infections, or whether it's a bad thing because it's only evidence that you're not catching what you should. So uh, that might be all well and good, uh, but how do you actually measure this? How do you measure dwell time? Uh, how do you figure out how long we've been here? I mean, isn't the whole point that they've been here and we didn't know about it? So how do we, you know, how do we track what we don't know? And, uh, and then after that, how do we reduce dwell time? So um, now I'm going to uh, stop briefly, uh, see if we have any uh, questions. Martin, do we uh, have anything? Not yet, JT, um, or John, I should say. I'm sorry. Um, sounds like the hackers are smarter than the people that are trying to protect the, the, the systems. Well, um, in some cases, yes. Uh, in some cases, no. Um, I actually, I, I think overall, uh, security security teams, IT uh, teams, uh, are are very are, are very intelligent, well educated people that have uh, that have so many more uh, more concerns on their plate than just cybersecurity. <clears throat> They're often understaffed or uh, or under resourced either in <clears throat> excuse me either in money uh, uh, technical resources uh, human resources what have you and uh, and it's often a struggle just to keep the network up and running rather than worry about um, some more detailed aspects of how we, how we track our progress in cybersecurity well we do have a question now how okay. is and I agree with your point of view it always comes down to money uh, mm -hmm. 
how is dwell time, the dwell time metric being pulled? Is that from altered files or some other baseline? Well, um, altered files uh, are, are one method of, of uh, measuring dwell time. So um, a, a good, uh, actually a really good uh, tool for, uh, uh, for tracking altered files is using a uh, intrusion detection system or an IDS. And that works by using, uh, by taking regular backups, uh, very regular backups, preferably more than, more than one per day. And, and verifying that they are in a known good state, meaning that you know that they haven't been manipulated or altered in, in any way. And then you, uh, you compare your current network state, your current file state, against this known good state to check for any differences that there may be. So um, that's one method that you can figure out that some files have been tampered with. Uh, so it, once you have a security incident or once you, once you have uh, your network compromised, then you can go back in time and, and do a post-mortem. And that's actually, uh, that's actually where we're going right now. But it's not always the, the, the way that you get it in. Uh, you can check your uh, you can check your server logs. You basically go back through a chain. So uh, it's actually a, a great um, a great transition into uh, where we're going here. Now Lockheed Martin uh, has famously come up with the uh, term of a cyber kill chain, and uh, it, it's a very it's a very cool term. It sounds it sounds cool. But uh, and actually, that's that's the case in a lot of cybersecurity. There are lots of aggressive terms uh, that that are come up with by by a bunch of geeks uh, like myself. So um, there's the kill chain. There's the kill zone. Uh, there's even a red team, uh, the FireEye. Uh, FireEye guys. They they do annual reports on cybersecurity, and and their team is the red team. Uh, but uh, Lockheed Martin came up with this uh, kill chain, this seven-step uh, process that is basically the anatomy for, uh, for a hacker getting into, exploiting, uh, and then, uh, and then taking, you know, taking advantage of your network. Uh, so very quickly, these are reconnaissance, uh, you know, figuring out what you've got, weaponization, figuring out how they can um, how they can use the tools at their disposal to um, uh, to act on that reconnaissance delivery, getting into uh, the network. This is where I, I as I talked about earlier, uh, now it's more often than not, or maybe not more often, but more prevalent for there to be a delivery over time, separate components over time to reduce the visibility of delivery and exploitation uh, of of that and. And installation, which really go hand in hand, and um, the first three steps. The reason why these are not in bold is uh, because, um, well, really, the your IT team can't do much uh, about this, at least as far as stopping threats as they're coming in, uh, where the IT and security team uh, can be effective is in the starting and the exploitation and installation phase, and then command and control when. Basically, the uh, it's it's go time for the hacker. They they flick the first uh, domino in in the chain, and, and move on towards uh, actually moving on what they came in for in the first place. Moving to step seven. That's that's one of the step six and step seven are the critical places where your security team can come into play. But uh, one thing to know about this, as far as measuring dwell time, is that while this seven this seven step is seven step process is the anatomy of of a malware attack, uh, for the purposes of dwell time and for the purposes of accepting that the perimeter has been breached, um, this isn't really uh, we're not using this to say, well, let's, let's catch threats as they come. We're using this to measure dwell time, which, and you do that by performing a post-mortem. So you have a security breach. You know that someone's gotten in. So now uh, is where you figure out your dwell time. You go back through the chain, and you say, okay, well, this is what they took, um, and this is... Uh, 
uh, now that we know that this happened, you can you can go through either your compromised files as the question that we had before. You can go through your server logs, as I mentioned. Uh, if it came through a phishing scam, uh, a matter which is a uh, means of social engineering, you can go through your uh, your email logs. Uh, hopefully, you have email logs and you keep them for a significant amount of time. We'll talk about that in just a bit. So basically, you you restep, you uh, you retrack the uh, the process that. Uh, that was gone through in order to compromise your system in the first place to figure out where this started, where it came from. So you know that, okay, it's it's April 21st. We've we've uh, we know that we've been compromised, and you go back through the process. You retrace the steps of the hacker uh, or the automated. Uh, software to see what happened and when it started. Like, okay, well, it turns out this process started in January 13th, so it took us about three months to get to it. So you uh, you track this in many different ways. Uh, with malware, you would go to the you would retrace the kill chain, uh, the seven-step process. Social engineering, go through whatever process was done there. And um, and you know so you you do have to do your postmortem differently depending on what type of attack it is. So if I can go back here, uh, this uh, this kill chain is for malware. That's for a a traditional what everyone thinks of as hacking attack. But you do need to use other methods, uh, you know, to to catch other methods. So. Reducing dwell time. Now, once you figure out, um, based off of your security incidents and, and what you've tracked, all the postmortems that you've done, once you figure out how long your dwell time is, um, then you can try to uh, then you can try to reduce that. And reducing that is is actually a reliable way of uh, of seeing that you've made progress in your cybersecurity efforts. Uh, more so than you know, the infected hosts or uh, or the number of security incidents seen, you're all you're here acting off of something that you know is a problem. You know actually happened. You know you've got a true positive, and you're retracing that to see when that true positive started. And once you can reduce that, you're acting on you're acting towards a goal uh, that that we know is uh, is valid because we know that the bad guys are already in. We know that the fortifications, the, the wall and moat, aren't sufficient. So uh, if I could uh, tell a quick story, there is a um, cybersecurity professional who worked for the U.S. Army for uh, I believe 24 years. I think his name is um, is Joe Schillinger, uh, and. He would always be asked by uh, by his superiors. Some generals would say, "Well, we're putting all this investment into cybersecurity. How do we know that this is actually paying off?" And he struggled with these metrics, and uh, and he wound he found himself uh, supporting dwell time after he left uh, the military uh, because it was it was really reliable. And how do you actually reduce this? Well, first uh, we're actually coming back to the uh, to the walls and moats. You know, you have to do the basics. Dwell time is something that's that's somewhat advanced uh, for many organizations when it comes to cybersecurity. We're just, you know, well, let's let's update our our software for the server before we start doing some tricky stuff. Let's make sure that we're using uh, two-factor authentication. Let's do backups, and you should have backups both on and off-site. And having backups off-site can actually help with your uh, your HIPAA compliance initiative uh, for your disaster recovery uh, plan. You need to have a disaster recovery plan anyway under HIPAA, so you need to account for that Katrina situation uh, or an earthquake, what, what have you, and have those backups, have all that PHI that you have off-site somewhere where it won't succumb to uh, to the natural disaster or whatever have, whatever it may be. Also, uh, the principle of least privilege is incredibly powerful, but it's something that's often neglected. Because, uh, well, first of all, the principle is that you, you and your workforce members, each one of them, only has permission to the extent that they have a legitimate need 
to, uh, to have that permission in order to fulfill their duties. So if you're talking about someone having administrative privileges on your server, uh, that should probably just be your IT team, and actually it should probably only be the, the head or, or the, the command and control unit within your IT uh, task force. You know, the, the vice president of resources doesn't need those privileges, neither does the secretary, neither does any, anyone else that doesn't have, uh, uh, that doesn't have a job duty to uh, go in and have the sort of access that uh, administrative privileges would give them. Also, uh, two-factor authentication. Two-factor authentication is something you know which would be something like a password or, uh, or a passcode, uh, and something you have. So it could be an ID card, a, um, a fingerprint scan, an iris scan if you're really fancy, and, um, and also isolation of environments. It's another basic tool that you can use um, you know, as a part of your blocking and tackling um, plan. Uh, isolating, let's say, your, um, your mail server from, uh, from your database server. So if one gets compromised, you're not, uh, the whole system doesn't get compromised. It's, it's much like uh, bulkheads in a ship. You know, if, if you've got one hole, it doesn't just flood the entire ship, it stays within that compartment. And that's what we're doing here, isolating different servers, isolating your test environment from your production environment, so on and so forth. We got a few questions, John. Oh, okay. Lockheed Martin is a DOD, so weaponizing, we're going back to that original uh, term, makes sense. How is that adapted for, adopted for healthcare? Weaponizing? Are you, um, I'm sorry, is the, uh, are you referring to the second um, step? The second yeah. step? Yes. Yes. Well, uh, weaponizing um, isn't. Um, yeah, Lockheed is a um, is a uh, DoD, uh, but as far as cybersecurity, the the term weaponizing isn't referring to anything specific to um, to the military industrial complex or really any industry. It's just a. It, it only refers to. Um, how do I put this? It only refers to um, basically the hacker figuring out how to how to use what they have in order to exploit what you have. And this this is a weaponization of ones and zeros. It's not it's not really a weaponization of uh, of any particular assets or uh, or it's much more abstract than that. So it's figuring out. Um, that on a very basic cybersecurity level in cybersecurity at obviously different organizations have different assets and, and different procedures and or in re regulatory schemes that they go through but um, but they can be attacked in, in much of the same way and and that's what weaponizing is referring to I, uh, I hope I've answered that question okay it's just a term then even though it's associated with the DOD requirements of Lockheed um, next question. This sounds all reactive. Isn't the goal to block at the delivery stage so your network isn't compromised? Well, um, that's that's actually a lot of um, uh, a lot of old school thinking is is completely protective. Uh, you know, well, the best way to make sure that that we don't uh, that we don't have any security issues, that we don't get compromised, is to prevent being compromised in the first place. So that's uh, that's the wall and moat approach to cybersecurity. And you're right. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, dwell time is uh, is very much reactive, but it's also uh, proactive to the extent that. Uh, you measure it based off of what you know has already happened to your organization. So in that sense, it's reactive. But it's also proactive in the sense that you can take these steps to reduce your dwell time, knowing that uh, the Huns aren't just at the gates, they're already through the gates. Some degree of reactivity is, is just a part of the game. 
And the sooner that, uh, that we can accept that that's the case, then the sooner we can um, not only react to that, but also uh, take some prescriptive methods um, to prevent uh, other actors in the future being able to do to our organizations what they've been able to do before. Um, what counteractions can be taken if the dweller is spending dwell time in, say, a honeypot? Hmm. Well, first you can um, uh, you can sort of do a similar postmortem uh, as you would if they had uh, if they had gotten into your system. Now, if if they get into a honeypot, I mean, I obviously. Uh, for, for those that don't know, honeypots are um, are designed to be very attractive uh, targets for hackers uh, and automated um, hacking programs or scripts. Uh, so they can so you can capture what's out there uh, and, and you know capture what's out there. Uh, so so that's what a honeypot is. It's it's designed to be a very very attractive target for hackers and automated scripts. And uh, one thing you you can do uh, for that is to see how uh, see how the honeypot was exploited. Now that might be uh, that might be a bit too easy given that it was designed to be exploited. But uh, but you still find uh, some very interesting you can still find some very interesting attack vectors through there. So say um, if the honeypot was exploited by coming through a port that. Uh, a port that was open on the honeypot that's also open in your production environment, and then that's something that you can take into account and try to address. You know, does this port need to be open? Do we need to trust this? Uh, a good way to get down dwell time is to implement, excuse me, implement a no trust environment. No one's allowed in uh, that hasn't been designated to be allowed in. No ports are open unless it needs to be open. Uh, in order to accomplish tasks of the server and uh, and so forth. Oh, to your point, yeah, opening um, any of the ports would be like opening the compartment on the ship that's already been where you've compartmentalized the water leak, right? Well, uh, kind of, yeah, kind of. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so uh, it increases it increases your attack surface area. And one of the goals here is to reduce that surface area as much as possible. Okay, that's all the questions we have for the moment, John. Okay, and uh, you know, if uh, if I don't um, sufficiently answer anyone's questions, I'd be happy to. Um, if we could get some more clarification, you know, if, if I start answering your wrong question or what have you. So um, thank you for um, for providing those. It's uh, very much appreciated. So another uh, another tactic you can you can use to reduce dwell time would be to record and monitor. This helps both with uh, conducting your postmortem, and it helps with catching uh, catching new attacks as they come in. So if you're maintaining logs of preferably every server and network event that you have, uh, all your email communications, and um, and you know it's it's interesting here because um, if it's it's true you should you should track it if it's trackable and uh, and you should also keep keep these logs off site if possible or, or at least not not be uh, publicly available we talked about isolating your environments this sh uh, these logs should probably be in a environment that um, is very difficult to get to because um, one of the one of the things about security measures is that they can themselves present avenues uh, for exploitation. So if a bad guy gets into your server and you have all of your server logs, all of your email communications, which might have sensitive information themselves on there, then they can all of a sudden they use what they use the tools that you're using to track them for them to track you. And that actually it happens with SIEMs as well that we discussed before. Um, if they're configured poorly, then um, then they can actually they can use the security tool as a security uh, loophole because these uh, these tools have very broad privileges. They have basically access to everything, 
And if they're not configured very well and they're compromised, then now the hacker has access to everything as well. Also, endpoints and um, and your devices. Healthcare organizations, um, you know, clearing houses, uh, business associates, uh, really, really across all industries, so many devices are becoming are becoming connected to the network. We've got we've got an Internet of Things now. That's nothing incredibly new, but it is something that's growing. You know, um, <clears throat> so. Um, you know, all of these endpoints are uh, are entry points as well, and these should be monitored. Preferably, they should be put on a uh, on a whitelist of some point of of some description. So you only let certain devices in to the network. Uh, you should have a policy and procedure for authorizing new devices. If someone, if you employ say a uh, a bring your own device and you have new hires that bring your own devices. There should be a standard procedure for getting those devices authorized, uh, probably through MAC addresses, but actually um, you might want to use your own unique identifier because uh, MAC addresses, they're, they're the default way of having a unique device ID, but they're very easily faked. Um, it's, it's pretty trivial to um, fake or spoof a uh, MAC address, so you might want to give your own unique identifier there. And also priority. Priority in addition to some of the, the blocking and tackling and all these other things we've been talking about is that uh, just, like, uh, just like IT teams, just like any business environment, uh, you, you can't do everything at once. Uh, if you've got a hundred points of entry or, you know, probably thousands of points of entry, but for the sake of um, simplicity, if you've got a hundred things to deal with, you can't tackle all of them all at once. So figuring out which are your biggest points, what's the, what's the, most, uh, what's the most important target? You know, probably your, um, your C-suite members. Um, if, you have a, uh, if you have a research and development team, those guys as well, your IT, uh, their, those user accounts themselves, all of these people can access the network to some degree. Obviously, you should be using the uh, principle of least privilege, but um, even so, uh, even if you do that, the reason these people are high-value targets is because they do have a legitimate need to access very important information to your organization. So if they can compromise them, and they get inform that information too. Also, the tools that you use, they um, vary from, um, from capability. They vary in capability from tool to tool. And any tool that you use, uh, like security tools or, or anything that has broad privileges, um, you should address uh, those vulnerabilities there first if you can. There's a quick question here. What's the best source for staying informed of security news and programs? Um, there are there are actually lots of there there are lots of good sources out there. There's um, let's see, uh, Dark Reading um, is a website that's commonly used by uh, information security professionals to um, to trade uh, to trade perspectives and um, and, and uh, ideas on, on computer security. That's actually very good. Um, at a very high level, um, uh, surprisingly, or uh, maybe not so surprisingly, uh, the BBC actually has plenty of uh, plenty of articles that are, uh, are broken down in, in very um, in very clear terms, and um, and actually catches uh, catches a lot of interesting developments um, from. From a broad perspective, uh, it's pretty good. Um, let's see, there are there are several LinkedIn groups as well. If uh, if you go into LinkedIn and search for cybersecurity or information security, there are um, there are some good groups uh, there as well with very very active conversations. And um, it's important um, when you go um, when you go looking at any of these sources that. 
a lot of this content is is user generated. You know, it's it's one IT professional, you know, talking to another. So uh, so everyone obviously has their own perspectives on what you should do, what you shouldn't do. You know, uh, one one person will say, well, you know, you should really block this. You should block this port, or you should. Um, or, or you should enable this tool, and then there will be five people coming after that saying, "No, that doesn't that doesn't really make a difference. Uh, what you really need to do is over." So, um, so definitely, you know, take things with a grain of salt. Try to try to gain a um, uh, a, a general view of, of what's going on out there, uh, like um, and and what the trends are with hacking. You know, some sometimes the writing is on the wall you know ransomware obviously is, is uh, jumping up in the headlines a lot but um, uh, while it's relatively recent for it to be headline news it was something that was discussed in in some uh, in some security circles on, on the web for for um, for quite some time uh, but we have no more questions John okay so further in reducing dwell time, much like um, we at uh, the HIPAA Survival Guide preach with uh, with HIPAA compliance in general, uh, it's it's just as important uh, with cyber the cybersecurity aspect of that, which obviously touches more on the security rule, to use people and processes along with your technical technological safeguards. Um, it's it's very common for people to be like, well, it's it's cybersecurity, so cyber is you know technical stuff, so you you handle that by doing technical stuff. But it's uh, it's just as important. It's actually it's uh, probably more important to bring in the people aspect of things, bring in the procedure aspect of things, because technology alone will not just it won't tackle it. Um, you can have the intrusion detection software, you can have the SIEMs, you can have logs, but unless you have the procedures to go along with uh, and complement these technical things, unless you train your workforce, um, then, then you're going to be leaving yourself open and open to some, uh, in a pretty big way. I mean, what, what, do, what good does it do to spend thousands of dollars on all these technical tools if you've got your entire workforce clicking on emails um, that were maliciously started. So um, I think it's a pretty interesting um, uh, statistic here. More than 75, actually I think it's 79% uh, of phishing schemes um, in, in the corporate world are uh, actually accomplished by, uh, by emails posing as security alerts from IT. And um, this is an oldie but a goodie. Actually, it's it's very common both both in the corporate sphere and uh, and in general in taking advantage of individuals to um, uh, to gain access by social engineering by some sort of message, uh, text message now or uh, or email that claims to be uh, claims to be on the other side. You know, uh, warning your your Mac has. Like you'll you'll be browsing uh, on the web and you'll get warning. Your Mac has has a virus on it. Do you want us to scan it for you? Do you want it? And um, surprise, surprise, it, it didn't have your best interests at heart after all. Actually, there's um there's a new one I just saw today. Uh, well, I guess this has happened before, but but there's a new round of it just today where people will receive uh, iPhone users will receive uh, text messages. Claiming that uh, that their Apple iCloud password is about to expire, and that they have to refresh it right now, so um, so they'll they'll get your uh, they'll get your credentials through that, and and then they have the keys to the castle. So in addition to that, uh, enforcing your password strength. This actually um, this is a mix of technical safeguards and um, and training um, in in HIPAA the uh, uh, password strength is actually falls under the technical safeguards, but it does involve some training as well. It's very common for passwords um, to be repeated over and over. Uh, I, I wish this webinar was actually a seminar so we could do a raise uh, a showing of hands of how many people use the same password or trivial deviations from the same password for everything. Um, John, they can raise their hands. 
Oh yeah. 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 Ah, you got it. You got it. Let's do a hand raise then. Well, I asked the question. Oh, I'm I'm bouncing here. Do no. I need to initiate the hand raise? No, no, I'm, 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 I've I've got it. Uh, how many people use the same password that's familiar to them? Birthday, husband's birthday, whatever. Over and over again. Well, this is a good group. Nobody does that. Nobody does that. That's that's awesome. That's good to hear. Um, no, I know it's very common. Uh, so so congratulations to everyone on not using the same password for everything. Uh, so um, there should be uh, obviously uh, uh, strong passwords, uh, unique passwords. People shouldn't be sharing the same ones. And um, and they should be changed uh, regularly. Uh, a good a good aspect uh, or a good way to defeat at least some versions of uh, at least some instances of long dwell times is uh, is to um, change your passwords regularly. Say it's often done every six months or so. You can make that uh, whatever period of time works best for your organization. But um, it's it's relatively likely that some of your passwords will have been compromised at some point, and having a regular refresh rate of those it, it stops them from becoming sale, uh, stale. And uh, along with uh, training and procedures, actually a part of training procedures, getting enterprise buy-in, you know, from uh, the entire organization needs to understand um, that that cybersecurity. Dwell time being uh, an important measurement of your success in cybersecurity is is critical for your uh, for your business. Um, a lot of hackers are coming after your intellectual property, your trade secrets, and for many businesses, that's that's everything. That's your whole organization. Um, Coca Cola repeatedly gets hacked looking for that secret recipe. Um, I, I think they've they've managed to keep it secret so far. So, through using basic using basic blocking and tackling, you know, make sure that your that your systems are up to date. You know, you're you're um, you're keeping track of of all of, all of the traditional methods of cybersecurity. That's where you start, and you should additionally record and monitor. This will help you with doing your post mortems, figuring out what your dwell time is if you're actually improving your dwell time. And if you're making progress, uh, if you're getting some return on your cybersecurity investment, prioritization because we can't tackle everything at once, and absolutely bringing in training and procedures uh, for uh, um, for completing uh, your initiative of cybersecurity. It can't just be firewalls. And obviously, repetition. We love repetition. We're all about agile here. We're going to talk about agile a bit more. And um, and it goes not just for um, not just for HIPAA compliance, but for cybersecurity in general. You can't tackle all of this at once, uh, and you can't really know what the problem is until you start dealing with it. And once you start dealing with it, then you can get better at it. Then you do it again, and you get better and better and better. So. Uh, that is our dwell time discussion. We will be um, looping this in uh, or weaving this in uh, occasionally as we go through. But we're going to move on here to a uh, comprehensive, uh, comprehensive HIPAA compliance initiative. What what that is. And uh, before we do that, I just want to see if there are any uh, wrap up uh, questions when it comes to dwell time. There, there is no additional questions on dwell time, John. Okay. So we like to think of HIPAA compliance as a three-legged stool, the privacy rule, the security rule, and uh, the newest leg of the stool uh, in 2009, the breach notification rule. Now, obviously, these don't cover everything. There are subspecialties uh, within uh, HIPAA compliance, like uh, 
um, cloud compliance, uh, dealing with social media. These are, uh, are pretty nuanced topics that have their own uh, pitfalls to them, you know, uh, that are ne ne not necessarily fall outside of these three legs, but are nuanced enough and specific enough that, um, that they warrant their own discussion. And you solve these three, you address these three legs by um, having what HHS calls a culture of compliance. Now they don't, they don't really go into detail on what a culture of compliance is. So uh, what we use is VDE, visible, visible demonstrable evidence of compliance, which includes policies, processes, and tracking mechanisms to create that visible, demonstrable evidence so you actually can demonstrate that you have a culture of compliance. It needs to be a part of your DNA. This isn't something that you train on and then, oh yeah, Sally's done the training, Steve's done the training, and we'll see you again next year, uh, which is how many organizations go about their compliance. And that's not a culture of compliance. It's not in your DNA if that's what you're doing. You can't you need to have the policies, which is the aspirational language, uh, what you intend to do. There are processes which actually effectuate those policies and make them more than just flowery language, and the tracking mechanisms, which essentially validate that the processes are being in place. So you have something, you're actually doing something, and you can prove that you've done it. In your compliance program, has to allow you to actually track this VDE, and it needs to do it for each requirement. There are 169 requirements in HIPAA, approximately 80, uh, give or take, for uh, each the security and the privacy rule, and 10 for breach notification. So, um, and, and those those are the cornerstones. You need to have it for each requirement. Not just well, you know, we've we've done it overall, and what that really means is that you need to understand each of these requirements, and um, and you can't show uh, you can't show that you have uh, that you've completed this just by having a uh, just by having the policies or just by having uh, processes. All three need to come together, and if you don't have if you don't currently have visible demonstrable evidence of compliance, then at least you can start. This is our agile methodology. If you, know, if the, if you don't even have the flowery language, if you don't even have the policy, then start with the flowery language. Get that down on paper. And then on your next iteration, you can say, okay, well, we've got a policy. How are we going to implement that policy? And so on and so forth. And each of these is at the granularity level of a requirement. There's lots of myth-making uh, out there with, uh, with HIPAA about what it does and doesn't require. And, and when you often get questions about, well, um, it, does it really, uh, do business associates really have to comply with this? Well, yeah, yeah you do. There, unfortunately, there's no, uh, there's no HIPAA light. Uh, we, sometimes, we often wish that there was, but um, it's all about the requirements. If it is a requirement, yes, you need to do it. If it isn't requirement, then no, no, you don't. I mean, it might be good practice, uh, but uh, you know, but you can be compliant without it. And, and HIPAA compliance, as we as we know, is is hard enough. So, comes down to the requirements, and here they are. These are the privacy rule requirements. Obviously, we're not going to go through each one of these, and. Um, and there are audit protocols uh, for each leg of this tool. There are audit protocols for the privacy rule, different protocols for um, security, and for breach notification. And each of the audit protocols goes by um, goes by these requirements. Now, these are for the uh, these are the requirements that we've sort of um, uh, consolidated, or in some time, some cases expanded. So what what we've done uh, with the survival guide is consolidate uh, some of these requirements into checklist items, and those checklist items are the policies, processes, and tracking mechanisms. So each item it has that VDE built into it, and it may uh, it may be the case that some requirements. Uh, um, 
can be consolidated into just one checklist item that does cover all the requirements. Others need to be broken up. So it doesn't come it doesn't come out to be um, point for point uh, a one to one relationship between the requirements and the checklist items that we recommend, but it does cover all 169 requirements. One aspect to note about this uh, patient's bill of rights, these are the checklist items for, um, uh, for the bill of rights, uh, but um, that, that's a term that we use here. Uh, HHS doesn't, doesn't uh, talk about a patient's bill of rights. It's, it's something that we've used as a um, helpful tool. And you've got your administrative requirements. There aren't, uh, um, there aren't too many there for the requirements, but there are many safeguards your technical requirements and your physical requirements as well. And uh, if, uh, if you're just starting and, and you're starting on your Agile methodology, uh, we would suggest that you start with the administrative. Uh, that's where your risk assessment is, uh, which you need in order to start. Uh, you can't really tackle things unless you know what you're tackling. And your risk management is also there. Probably about 80% of the security role is in your administrative um, um, procedures and, and safeguards. Um, after that, uh, uh, your technical safeguards, uh, like auto log off, that's where the strong passwords are that we discussed before. And, uh, and finally, your physical safeguards, like keeping uh, the doors to your server room locked, you know, th things like that. But um, in priority, we would go administrative and technical and then physical. And breach notification is actually sort of different. Uh, there are 10 uh, requirements for breach notification. Uh, the, the, the hairiest one, it seems to be for, um, for many entities, is figuring out what is a breach. Uh, and, and what the process is there for, for going about it. So it's a bit different than security and privacy. Uh, we'll go through all that. And here you can see the 169 and how they're broken up in between, uh, between each of the rules. And uh, personal solutions really are everywhere. There are hundreds. There are hundreds of, uh, of one aspect or, or um, a subset of aspects of HIPAA that, that are offered. And, um, and it really can be, uh, really can be death by a thousand cuts because you've got so many, uh, you've got so many uh, vectors and now we're not just talking about cybersecurity, we're talking about organizational uh, regulatory vectors that you need to, uh, that you need to account for. Um, that partial solutions can be helpful for that, but they're just a part of it. And what you really need is the combination of um, software and what we call wetware. Now, wetware is the biological gray matter in a fixed medium that other humans can understand, that they can consume. And, you know, that, that's great, but what, what really is that? You know, it, it's it's the breach. It, it's the, the breach. It's the uh, it's the connection. It's the um, consolidation of uh, of your HIPAA compliance. It's what you need to know in order to have the big picture. You know, your your software is great, but in in order to use it to use it effectively, in order to be in compliance, you need to know how to use it. Know what you're trying to use it for. What your goals are. And that's the knowledge transfer vehicle of wetware is education. So software, as I said, that's where you store your stuff. That's that's your technical tools, um, you know, tracking mechanisms. Uh, part of your part of your VDE is, uh, is stored in software. That's in your Excel spreadsheets. That's in your databases. Um, and, and so on. So that's it's really a managerial tool for what wetware is, which is your, um, which is right at the heart of your compliances. Do we have any uh, questions at this point? Well, we have one question, and that was, where can I get a download or a copy of that spreadsheet? And if the, it didn't identify it, I was doing something else at the time, and I don't know 
what he's referring to, but if he would tell me which spreadsheet he's talking about, we'll see what we can do. Uh, okay, I would guess that um, uh, they are referring to the um, uh, to the checklist items that uh, we were going through just a minute ago, okay. which I I believe is I, I believe they're on our uh, on our survival guide site. Is um, we can backtrack there real quick. Right. Are these the um, requirements um, that you were uh, you were discussing? Our esteem questioner. Yes, is the answer. Yes. Okay. So um, I, I think these are uh, these are on our site, or maybe they're, maybe they're uh, included as part of our um, uh, as a V four for the survival guide itself, I and mean, they're attached to that. Do you know, Martin? Um, let me let me check on that. And here's another question: Is a help desk and project management system enough for VDE, or is something else needed? Help desk and project management. Uh, that's uh, it would be a start. Um, management. Uh, well, I'm actually. Can you clarify the project management? Uh, because if your project management in, in such as a CM system such as the CM system I'm, I'm sorry I have to admit my ignorance here I'm not I don't know what CM system is well content uh, I, I would call it content management but maybe that's not what it is project management is all for new implementation implementation of new services and servers Mm -hmm. You know that it will um, it will start it will start the process. Um, you know, and, and it will very much it will help with uh, with maintaining uh, your your proof of EDE. So uh, your proof of culture of compliance. So if you've got a uh, an audit coming your way or uh, or, or I'm not sure if this is more or less fortunate a lawsuit coming your way where um, where the regulations for HIPAA will most likely be considered your standard of care uh, and, and likely negligence will be the, uh, the avenue that they'll be going after there. So if either of those things come your way and you have to show that you have uh, that you have compliance, it sounds like that system would be very helpful for showing that but, uh, but it won't be a magic bullet. I mean, it takes um, it takes a lot of effort, a lot of sweat to um, to come up with compliance and uh, and to turn it um, to turn your organization into into one that actually does it on a daily basis and is constantly trying to get better. So, well, that that's a good step. Uh, and it will certainly be helpful for for showing your proof. You have to develop that proof in the first place. So, do you also have those policies? You know, do you also enforce the policies? Uh, and do you have proof of those policies that you can then put into the system? Uh, so, I suppose that that's that's the real question. That's that's the headache. Yeah. Um, the John to to mention something the CM definition which I said content management because that's what I'm familiar with is change mm -hmm. management tracking server and network changes. Uh, um, well, uh, again, that would be that would be helpful uh, both for. Uh, both for HIPAA compliance and um, and for the dwell time uh, side of cybersecurity as well, or just cybersecurity in general, changing uh, or tracking your uh, your changes, uh, any alterations to your environment is is definitely a good way to um, you know to detect malicious or or even inadvertent uh, changes uh, that may be inaccurate. Uh, any deletions of data, you know, it, it might be just as, or actually, it is just as common that uh, that your breaches of cybersecurity, at the very least, and often with HIPAA as well, come from uh, negligence. 
just you know a uh, a laptop with uh, with PHI gets you know gets left and walks out the door or gets left in a cab um, or you know files get deleted so in that sense changing or uh, or tracking the changes to your environment uh, would assist with that. That's all the questions we have for the moment. Okay, let's see where we can go here. Oh yeah, so uh, compliance software without the wetware, as we were discussing, is is really an empty container. You can't just have the software. You need to be able to put it to use and make sure that you're tracking each of the requirements. It can make you feel pretty good, like oh well, we've got the software and. Um, um, you know, so we're covered, and and that's really just the start. You may have the container, uh, which is which is a good start, but you need to have it full as well. And software requires wetware in order to do that. Now, um, something to be uh, to be careful about, uh, buyer beware, is that compliance software is often sold as as wetware. It's sold as this is everything you need to know. This is HIPAA compliance in a box. Uh, it's it's actually pretty common out there, and and there are many uh, point solutions to this particular solutions to aspects of HIPAA compliance that are either sold as as a complete package. Uh, and this is all you need, or uh, or they're they're upfront about the fact that this is this is all that it covers. It only covers incident management. It only covers you know security incident tracking or network monitoring. And some of these are uh, are very important as far as getting up and getting up and running. You know you can't um, you can accomplish compliance and you can uh, effectuate effective cybersecurity without some of these tools, like network monitoring um, or, or security incident tracking, intrusion detection, they're all very important. Um, obviously, you need a risk assessment in order to, um, in order to comply with HIPAA. I mean, it's, it's like rule number one under the administrative uh, requirements, but it's not the whole package. It's not everything in a box. It really goes on and on. We were talking about the three-legged stool and that uh, that there are other nuanced uh, areas like social media, cloud computing, um, but and and there are actually some really good really good tools that uh, Carlos has uh, told me are out there. I, I haven't seen any uh, really uh, really good tools on social media when it comes to HIPAA, but um, but I'm sure that <laughs> I'm sure that they're out there. And uh, disaster recovery and, and business continuity. Uh, obviously, very important and covered under HIPAA. I mean, all of these, they're, they're aspects, but it's important to note that it's not the whole thing. And it's also, uh, it's also pretty common for there to be uh, feel-good uh, feel solutions, which are distinct from the point solutions of, well, we'll do this one thing. It's, you know, we'll, we'll certify you to do this, or you need to do is, you know, spend an hour. Uh, or you do training for your workforce that might be, you know, 30 minutes or, you know, very, or done at such a high level at 100,000 feet that you can't really get too much out of it. And, and it may feel good. You may be able to sign the paper that, yes, I've taken this training. But if the training isn't comprehensive, if it isn't down to the rule requirement, uh, then you're really not getting too much out of that. There are hundreds of point solutions available. What the difference is, uh, and the, uh, the crucial difference really, is a comprehensive component, a comprehensive approach is really what you need, um, whether it's on its own or by linking together the point solutions with your wetware, uh, as long as you get there. And uh, your core training when it comes to education, education being the first prong here in a comprehensive solution, is to, to simply know the rules uh, at starting, starting maybe at a higher level with high-tech omnibus privacy. Uh, omnibus, uh, obviously, pretty, pretty recent. I think it was finalized in 2013. So, um, and the business associates, whether you are a business associate or you simply work with business associates, there is a lot of confusion about exactly what they need to comply with 
and what needs to be in their agreements. Um, you know, on, on both sides of this, you know, like what is what needs to be in our contract, um, and and it can be uh, it can be very important and very confusing at the same time because now now we don't just have to deal with HIPAA, we have to deal with uh, with contract legalese as well, and unfortunately, that's that's part of the beast. Uh, you do have to have in your BA uh, uh, agreements that you will uh, be able to essentially audit uh, one another down uh, down through the chain. And um, and if you don't have that in your business associate agreement, whether you are the BA or or you are a covered entity or a clearinghouse. Um, then, when the time comes to do that, if there's a if there's a potential breach um, or uh, or an audit, uh, then it, it will it will come back and it'll ruin your day. Also, I have to have uh, your risk assessment training, management training, and uh, in the nuanced areas of social media and cloud computing, we have uh, checklists on on each of these things as well. Then. <clears throat> that will guide organizations from along different tracks. So we have a core track and a foundational track, and, and then there are subsequent tracks that organizations can take on and, and, and tackle you know, after they've done the baseline, after they've gotten their framework. OK. We have one question to work here with. Uh, best practice to prove VDE suggestions on how we prove VDE. Well, um, having your um, uh, having all of your training, your processes, and your um, and your policies logged is, is probably the, the the best way of showing that VDE. It needs. Um, needs to be visible, demonstrable evidence of compliance. So that means if a auditor comes knocking on your door and says, okay, well, do you have a policy for this? You need to ha actually have a record of that policy. You should have a change log of that policy, you know, because policies change over time. So uh, somewhere in, in your organization, you should uh, have not just the policies, but the history could have, okay, well, um, next next question that the auditor is going to have, well, do you have a policy in, in place to actually, is, is this just something that you put on the wall like it, like it's our mission statement, or do you, um, do you actually enforce this? And to that, you can have VE by saying, yes, yes, we enforce this. This is how we enforce it. This is when we've enforced it in the past. If um, if an employee has violated HIPAA, then we've got a policy for uh, for discipline that starts with you know uh, starts with warnings and goes to written warnings, going all the way up through suspension, and termination, and we've actually implemented that. So and so violated uh, violated the privacy rule on such a such a date, and um, and this is uh, the remediation. Uh, that we took. This is how we followed our policy. This is how we implemented our process. And same thing with training. Training is a very important part of HIPAA compliance. So have, have uh, as your workforce taken the training courses? What courses have they taken? When have they taken them? When's the last time that they took them? Um, did you have any sort of verification? You know, it's one thing to watch a video and to sign a form saying, yes, I watched the video. It's another if you have an additional step, like a test or a quiz um, that, uh, that your workforce can show that they've actually paid attention to the video or, or what other, whatever training you've done, and that they understand it as well. So just, just being in the room doesn't count. We need more than warm bodies. And having that sort of evidence of each stage in your compliance process and having that readily available uh, is is really the best way to go about it. Here, Mr. Auditor, here it is, right here. So a HIPAA repository. I'm sorry? So a HIPAA repository is what we're talking about, taking all those files and putting in, in them in a particular place. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and 
uh, it's a repository, but it's um, it's definitely uh, it's it's a light years away from a three ring from the three ring binder of of old HIPAA compliance. You know, this is a repository that is it's it's a living living document. It's it's a repository of living documents. So uh, it's where your entire compliance strategy and and fulfillment is. That's where it lives. And if you ever need to account uh, to account for anything that's going on, well, then it's all at your fingertips, and you and you can get to the bottom of the issues as as they come there. So, with our requirements, these uh, we've got uh, quite a few here, but uh, and and we're not going to go over each one. We've got the um, we've got the slides for today's uh, webinar. Uh, Martin, have they been uh, is that working? Has that been verified? Got the handout uh, is the, the handout, sir. Uh, section in there, in there. Yes, sir. Awesome. Okay. So um, we'll have uh, these slides are are at your uh, disposal, so you can go through these in more detail uh, if you so choose. But these are the requirements for the privacy rule. Workforce sanctions, we were just discussing that. Documentation, very important for making sure that you can uh, have that VDE so that you can show HHS that you have a culture of compliance, that you're taking this seriously. And it doesn't need to be perfect. Uh, your policies and procedures, um, every, every aspect of these rules, it doesn't need to be perfect. You just need to start going with it. And, um, and, and that's, that's really what our Agile methodology is all about. And to be honest with you, almost no one. If anyone is absolutely 100% HIPAA compliant, I would love to meet them. Because uh, organizations from, uh, from the gamut, uh, whether, it's, uh, whether it's mom and pops or it's one of the biggest healthcare organizations uh, in the country or in the world, um, they, have, they have trouble complying with HIPAA because obviously as, as your organization grows, so do all the things that you have to keep track of, all the people you have to keep track of, their training, their their processes. You have different departments, you know. Well, you, well now you've got a whole different department. If if you're a large organization, if you're an emerging healthcare organization, then you didn't have an IT department before. Now you do. You didn't have a, a HR department. Now you do. I'm just going to go. Quickly here, these uh, I, you know they cover everything. Your emergency mode operation plan, and and we actually uh, we translate these for you, as we can get down here a little bit. Uh, into we'll go through our step by step. Into this is what the rule says. This is what the rule means, and this is how you track and enforce your compliance with the rule. For the breach notification, it's actually this is where we get into a bit of a different beast, slightly different from the uh, security or privacy rule. Uh, so it's largely focused on analysis. So how do you? Well, first of all, do you, could you see a breach if if you had one? Would you recognize it as a breach? And it sound it sounds simpler than it is because you can't have a breach without a privacy rule violation and as we just quickly scroll through all the privacy rule uh, requirements, it's it's not exactly a trivial trivial thing to figure out whether there's been a privacy rule violation. Uh, so uh, there's an analysis of whether that has happened. And then, uh, okay, well, if there's been a privacy rule violation that has gotten out there, then was it unsecured data? Was it unsecured PHI? Um, if if uh, in this analysis your answer to these questions, and we, we've got an uh, a, a analytical framework uh, that we, we provide to our subscribers, if, um, if your answer to these questions along the way is no, uh, then you're done. You know, if there's no privacy rule violation, you're done. There's no breach by definition. If, uh, if there was a violation or there would have been a violation, but the only, thing, the only EPHI or PHI that got out was secured, it was encrypted, so it was uh, unreadable, uh, indecipherable, uh, then there's no breach by definition. 
So it's very much, uh, it's very much an analytical framework. What, uh, so what's your trigger? Your trigger is a security incident uh, that you go through this analytical framework to, um, uh, to resolve. Your timeliness, uh, when it comes to notifying uh, individuals of a breach, uh, you don't get to you don't get to let them know whenever you want. You need to let them know within 30 days, and uh, and let them know that they will uh, that you're going to get them the information. And if you need more time uh, than the 30 days that you're provided, and you can ask the patient for more time, but when you do that, you need to uh, you need to say, well, how much time do you need? If you can't do it in 30. Uh, can you do it in 45, 60? You, have, you can't just say, well, I just need more time. You need to be more specific than that. The content, what you're, what you're notifying them about. The uh, enforcement, uh, which is uh, essentially have you, uh, have you gone through the, this process? Uh, have you gone through the media notification if that's been triggered and so on? And uh, it's also uh, just just helpful to have some model letters uh, for media if you, if you need to notify them or HHS uh, when you need to notify them and you know whether or what timelines you need to notify HHS changes it's depending on the breach it could be 60 or it could be at the end of the calendar of the year uh, but when you're when you're going through a breach uh, that's that's when you already have your hair on fire. That's when you're scrambling. And that isn't really the time to be uh, to be drafting a um, uh, up a letter at that point. You've got a million things to do. If you've already got at least a model letter that you can just modify as needed, um, then then that can take some uh, some weight off your shoulders. So, do you uh, would you know a breach if you saw one? We uh, discussed that. Do you need to? Um, uh, do you have the analytical framework that you uh, that you need in order to go from tracking an incident to potentially going through and, and notifying media and HHS? And are you prepared for notification? Notification costs costs uh, quite a bit of money. Uh, it's a couple hundred dollars um, per record. So it gets it gets pretty big pretty quick. The the numbers get large, and uh, and you need to have some of these. Uh, uh, some of these frameworks and hopefully the models as well to uh, smooth this process over. I'm going to go through our step-by-step -step guidance. Uh, I think uh, it's been a few minutes. Just want to see uh, if we have any questions. Uh, not at this point. All right. So with our step-by-step -step guidance, we have here, uh, again, we're not going to go through each one of these. We have plenty of these here that just says a uh, start. So we've got uh, rule 001, a violation of the rule. And, um, and this, is, uh, this sort of tracks how, uh, how our checklist goes about this statement. So we've got the rule, and we've got our suggested policy statement right under it. And for these um, uh, for these uh, hyperlinks here, the the blue underlying text, uh, all those you can just when you look at your handouts of the slide, just go ahead and click on those, and it will it will bring you to um, to the portion of the survival guide that deals with that particular item. And uh, it's sort of uh, sort of like the HIPAA. I wouldn't say HIPAA for dummies, uh, but uh, but uh, it's a HIPAA breakdown. You know of uh, of each of the rules, and uh, not just our policy, uh, but our suggested process, our suggested tracking mechanisms. So you're not starting from scratch. One of the hardest things uh, about HIPAA compliance is starting from scratch, and you don't have to you don't have to do that uh, with with each of these rules. You, we've got something for you to go off of. Obviously, your organization each organization is different. You're going to need to tailor this, but it's something that you can start with. It's something that you can track. You can see here at the bottom we've got a scorecard feature, and that's for our organ or any organization to um, to give itself a grade on on what it's doing uh, with HIPAA compliance, and to do so on a requirement by requirement basis. Uh, so we start with zero going going down to four. 
you know, missing. We don't have anything at all. We, we are completely missing this requirement. I'm sorry. Planned, well, we don't have anything, but we're going to. Basic, maybe, yeah, we've, we've got something. We just started it. Um, you know, something, something's better than nothing, and, uh, you, you know, hopefully it gets better. And then functional, okay, well, we've had this for a while, it works, we know it works. Uh, could be better, but uh, but it, it's not something that's, it's not a duct tape solution. And obviously excellent, be excellent, you're in great shape for that role. And, you know, as I said, we go through this with each of the requirements. So eventually, you can give yourself a scorecard. You can um, go through the analytical frameworks that we provide and determine um, determine whether there has been a breach. That's what this flowchart here uh, assists you with going through. And tracking. Tracking here, you've got your scorecard with each of your requirements. And breach notification, I think we've covered that. So um, finally, with the Agile, this is this is the nucleus of compliance. Heavyweight compliance is old school compliance. You know, it's a one and done, big shot, starting from scratch, ending with complete product, you're done. And the problem with that is, uh, well, one, it doesn't uh, it doesn't really work with what's called wicked problems. Uh, wicked problems being uh, those which you can't really understand until you've already started to tackle them. And if you're if you're going with a heavyweight method, then um, it, well, first it was already going to be a bear because you're going from zero to a hundred, or you're trying to. And now you're probably never going to get done because the further you go through it, the more you understand that you don't understand. Now you have to go back three steps, take two steps to the side, and then try to go forward some more. And and that's why Agile, which is small, uh, iterative steps, um, is, is really the way to go for this sort of regulatory compliance. And uh, and it's really not that... Uh, it's really not that uh, the technology fails people most of the time, it's that the people and processes change. So as we discussed, once you tackle a project and you find out that you don't have uh, you don't have everything that you need or you misunderstood the problem as it was, then um, then you just end up in a uh, in in a compliance hell as it were. So agile is failing forward fast. It is rapable, <laughs> rapable, rapid and flexible response to the environment that you're working in, the problem that you're dealing with, your plan for dealing with that problem through the environment that you're working in. Failing forward fast. This is a Tom Peters uh, quote for Agile. Yes, you you will fail. You're not you're not going to get it perfect the first time, but you're moving the ball ahead. You're failing forward, and you're doing it iteratively. Because you're not doing one big project or multiple big projects, you're taking very, very many small steps towards getting better and better and better. And this is how you solve those wicked problems. All right, so the many small solutions, as we just said, uh, that, that's how you have to go about te tackling problems this big. Uh, you don't drop, you don't do it through uh, a big solution, and you need to get started. Uh, working from that blank page uh, is uh, it's scary, uh, and when you know that the problem is so big, it's it's tempting to delay uh, or or even. Uh, because you know it's a big problem, you name, you form a committee to name a committee to study the problem. You know, you you want to make sure that you got it right, that you get it right the first time, and 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 that winds up in in a lot more procedural steps towards getting anything done at all. So you need to really get started. You need to get started. Um, well, right now, you get started yesterday. I mean, the the High Tech Act came out in 2009. It's it's been quite some time. Uh, there's word of uh, HHS starting to do some desk audits, and uh, I don't know if they've they've started doing the desk audits yet. 
but um, it it is definitely um, uh, threatened and and for for good reason. Uh, you know, so many organizations are in willful neglect now that uh, that it wouldn't be hard to figure out that they're in willful neglect. You can uh, have the HHS just call up organizations, ask them a few questions, you get deer, deer in the headlights look, and um, and we're on our way to willful neglect fines of what fifty thousand dollars. And all of these, uh, all of the monies that that HHS HHS takes in will uh, just go into its coffers for more enforcement actions. So it's sort of its own self-propelling machine of the more the more uh, enforcement that it does, the more enforcement it's capable of doing. In agile versus heavyweight, as we've discussed, that's it's the difference um, in in how you process a problem and how you utilize the people, processes, and platforms to arrive at meaningful compliance rather than um, rather than some attempt that winds up failing, costs a lot of money, costs a lot of time, and and then winds up not doing anything for you. Which is what um, what the heavyweight model is. All right. So, um, when it comes to uh, healthcare, uh, healthcare, like uh, many industries or like every industry now, is being disrupted. It took a bit longer with with healthcare than it did with uh, with some other uh, other industries like financial services and banking, but um, it is absolutely happening with uh, patient portals and paying for performance instead of just paying for service. Some of that's Obamacare, some of it is, is, the, is the market moving ahead. Uh, different regulatory schemes, obviously the version 10 of ICD. You know, in, and uh, bring your own device, you know, there's different, uh, the, the Internet of Things, this comes into play with uh, almost every organization. And, and it's industry agnostic, but it's really just catching up to um, to the healthcare service. You know, healthcare has been the same for 150 years. It's payment for service, and now you, you not only have all of this all this new data coming in, all of these new challenges, uh, but you know, you've, uh, it really the world is turning upside down for um, uh, for healthcare. So 150, 150 years of change in just five. And these are S-curves here. So S-curves are uh, curves of innovation. And it starts off with you know, the birth. You're on your lower left-hand side. You're just starting to, to deal with something new. Then in your high growth stage, it starts getting picked up throughout the industry. Everyone's starting to do it. Think of the, uh, through, uh, the internet bubble uh, right before the uh, uh, 2000, and then max yield, where everyone uh, everyone is uh, sort of at the top of their game. Uh, this particular technology or this particular uh, process, way of doing things, this paradigm, and nothing lasts forever. So eventually, you if you stay at that level, if you stay doing that uh, that thing, and you don't jump to the next S curve, the next area of innovation then eventually you will form uh, uh, some stagnation and you'll go into a death spiral. So you need to jump from one S-curve to the other. And once you've gotten mature, you can't uh, stay on, uh, rest on your laurels. And that's true for really every industry. You have a small, uh, slow feedback loop with heavyweight and a very fast feedback loop with agile. So if you get started, get something done, get it down on paper, then it's okay. You know, you can improve it later on. Well, I, I love this graphic, uh, so I'll just leave it here for a second. Martin, do we have anything? Not at this time, John. Uh, the one thing I was going to point out with the agile versus the heavyweight is you don't know what you don't know, and that's what you'll find out if you use the agile method. Right, right, exactly, exactly. So one of the biggest problems is that you don't know what you don't know, 
And um, once you find it, well, now you're already 20% through, and uh, you might have to trash some of that. You might have to go back and completely rework it. Uh, and, and reworking can be harder than, um, uh, than the initial effort was in, in the first place. Um, so yeah, uh, that, that's a great thing about Agile is that uh, you, you get to learn that as you go and in steps. And it's, you know, and it's cyclical. So this is what, uh, I do love this graphic, uh, and really where we're trying to help here and provide value is in the simplification. You can assess where you are, uh, simplify where you are, and that's where being able to consolidate these rules into checklist items, into meaningful areas of attack, something that's actionable, that's uh, where we try to assist our, our uh, our customers and where where everyone is trying to, uh, we discuss the point solutions. They're they're trying to um, help with a lot of those issues as well, and protect yourself, monitor, report, and then back to assess each one of these stages, like protection um, and and monitoring. Uh, we discuss them as far as dwell time and as far as cybersecurity, and cybersecurity is largely in the security role. Uh, the security role is essentially a um, a, uh, a regulatory scheme uh, that complies with uh, with running a data center. It's how to run the data center 101, and a lot of that comes from protection and from monitoring, and then reporting. Reporting being the uh, the visible, demonstrable evidence side of these things. It's great if you protect. It's great if you monitor. But if you can't show that you protect, that you monitor, then um, then you're in some trouble. And uh, here is our shameless plug, uh, the HIPAA Survival Guide. We have a suite of products. I think it's, what, 18 or 20 now, Martin? It's uh, much more than that. And this is the wrong slide, John. Ah, uh, yes. The, um, it used to be uh, 7 dollars a year for our uh, subscription. It uh, just recently went up to uh, 24 dollars We are uh, in the process of producing our, uh, our uh, risk assessment program, which is called Expresso, which aims at, uh, at simplifying and tracking your risk assessment process from one assessment to another and making this something that uh, you can do in just a few clicks. And uh, so that, that's one of, the, one of the most difficult aspects of, of starting with the administrative uh, safeguards is getting that risk risk assessment done, figuring out where you are so you know where to go. And it's all about wetware. We uh, focus on wetware, we focus on uh, on comprehensive compliance and accept no substitute. So that is our presentation for today. And uh, if we have any parting questions, then uh, we'd be happy to answer them. No parting questions. No parting wait, wait questions. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Um, when do we know when the risk ass management assessment will be ready? I assume we're talking about Expresso there. About Expresso. Uh, Expresso is currently in development. We've got our programmers on it right now, and uh, we're actually moving into the testing phase. Uh, so obviously we're going to test this uh, very vigorously. We understand how important your data is to you and uh, the importance of getting a, uh, a good and, uh, and robust program out there. So our testing will take some time to make sure it's ready. Uh, so we're probably looking at um, mid to uh, potentially late May, but we're aiming for, uh, for mid-May. You might let some of us test it, test it for you. Was so, yeah, yeah, we, we might do a, we might do a beta. Uh, we haven't really discussed that, but uh, but we can we can run it by the uh, the powers that be. Yeah, that's above our pay grade, right, John? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and uh, we have volunteers here, so I will keep track of them. And okay. uh, that's all we have going for the moment. So I think. All right. 
Thank you everyone for your time. Uh, we appreciate it. We hope that this has been helpful to you. And um, uh, you know, we uh, we've got another webinar coming up next month. So uh, thank you very much, and I hope you have a good day.